Good evening, everybody, or good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, thank you so much for joining this evening. If you could just do the usual and let me know that you can uh, hear me by just posting a comment, that would be a huge help. So at least I know the technicals are working. So yeah, just give us a quick post so I know that you're, uh, you can hear me. Otherwise, I'm just talking to myself. That's great, folks. Thanks so much for uh, typing that in. You've no idea how good it feels when I can hear. Well, I can see that you say you can hear me. Ordinarily, at times like this, I'd say we've got two minutes, 52 seconds left. Get onto social media and let everybody else know we're going live. But don't. This is just for the email group. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. We've got great numbers uh, tuning in again this week, uh, all over the place, looking in the chat room there. Um, hands up if you weren't feet tapping during that music. <laughs> what was the music choice like? It's always difficult to know. It's always difficult to know. But listen, folks, thank you so much for joining uh, the second of the uh, email group only webinars. Uh, in the chat room tonight, I've just seen that we've got uh, great friends of mine. We've got Brian Jukes, we've got Anthony Crothers, uh, their admin, so behave, 
okay so behave because they can do things be an admin um but tonight i've got i don't know how long this is going to be it's not going to be a long one i know that uh but we're going to be going through um mainly the stuff that you kind of pointed out that you wanted to go through last week which was the coffee man photo shoot i'm going to show you basically how that's done um so there's three things i'm actually going to go through we're going to go through the coffee man shoot the process of using your your flash uh outdoors which is really easy Honestly, if you've ever struggled with it, I'm really open. By the end of this, you're going to go, seriously? Is that all there is to it? Honestly, it is seriously easy. So we're going to go through that. Then we're going to go through, uh, I want to just let you know about an event that's coming up in November where you've got some free Photoshop training. I'll give you some details about that. And then also, we're going to kind of finish off with a Photoshop technique that I've got for you, uh, which is actually using content-aware move um, in Photoshop, which has been around for a while. I've known it's there for a while, but I've never had the occasion or the or the sort of want to ever use it. But I did in the Coffee Man shoot, so I'm going to show you how you can do that. But we'll, we're going to crack on. I'm not going to waste any time here. We're going to go straight into it. Uh, oh, by the way as well, uh, there is obviously going to be a Q&A. So if you do have questions, make sure you post them in the, in the comment section there because Anthony and Brian, no doubt, they'll bring anything that's like urgent to my attention. Otherwise, when we get through this, because I'm going to go through the stuff, then we'll have a recap. And then we're going to do like the Q&A, and that's when I can cover those, if that's all right with you. But if it's urgent, do it in capital, so Brian and Anthony know, all right? <laughs> all right then, so cool. Right, let's just dive on then. So, oh yeah, I got my graphic to put up as well. I forgot to put that up. Right, so the one we're going to go through then is uh, this picture here of Paddy, uh, which is a real simple shot. I've got to say, if I, if I showed you my Lightroom now, which is where I imported all the pictures from the photo shoot, there were just five pictures taken in total. And that's not to say, oh, wow, aren't I clever? It literally is so simple to do. And I couldn't take much longer as well, to be honest with you, because Paddy was working. Uh, but this picture, which is pretty much the same kind of thing as this picture here, which I did a webinar for, I believe it was Castle Cameras going back a, a month or two now. So it's the same kind of process. So as we go through this, because I didn't kind of get Paddy to sit there and while I was doing some video, we're going to go through the process to do this picture here. And that's the exactly the same process for uh, when we did the picture, or when I did the picture of Paddy, all right? So, okay, kicking things off then. So we've got our camera, we're gonna be using some flash. Now, ordinarily, when we go outside, unless it's like you're in the UK, you go out and you see a nice kind of foreground area, all the place, you know, all the area that you're walking around in, and then you look at the sky and you see nice blue sky with clouds. Now, when you step out of your door, when you see it, your eyes, are amazing things they can expose for both so they're going to give you detail in all that stuff in the foreground all the shadow areas but you're also going to be able to see all the details in the sky your camera can't do that so we have to kind of tell it what our preference is what we want the camera to expose for the subject or the sky or the foreground rather and the subject or the sky all right so for example, if you were gonna go out and you're taking some pictures of a mate, like I was here with my mate Foxy, uh, this is the kind of thing you'd, you'd kind of take maybe. If you've not got a flash with you, you'd say, right, get Foxy or your mate to stand where you want them to be. Uh, you take a picture and if you're using something like TTL maybe, your camera's gonna try and expose for the scene, uh, but you're gonna to have to boost up that exposure compensation to, to get some decent light on Foxy. But while you're doing that, as you're increasing the kind of exposure on Foxy by using that exposure compensation or whatever, you're gonna lose detail in the sky. So it's a real trade-off. You, can you can't have both, you can have one or the other, all right? But this is why we have a flash. Because with a flash, we can get the camera to expose for one part, which will be the scene, and we can get the flash to create the exposure on the other part. And obviously when we take a picture, the camera captures both the ambient and the flash, makes one picture, we're job done. And it's kind of like a bit of a follow on from, I guess, last week when we talked about, you know, the, the sort of the invisible black background where you use your camera to create the scene and then you use your flash to, uh, to light the subject. This is pretty much the same kind of thing, but you don't go to the extremes of making the scene black, all right? For example, let's just say, um, well, I've just got a question from Mike. Trevor, do you set flash level to your aperture or do you slightly overexpose with the flash? Trevor, I'll come to that in a moment. I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, definitely, I will. Right, so here we go. Let's just say then, 
I, I tend to shoot manual when I'm outside. That's just my preference. And I do that because ever, ever kind of changing environment with the clouds moving, the sun going behind the clouds and that kind of stuff. If I go in manual, for me, I feel that it gives me much more of a consistency from shot to shot, as opposed to TTL would vary the exposure depending on what it's presented with. So I like to stick with manual because it, it gives me that consistency. So let's just say then I'm outdoors. We've now taken that natural picture of Foxy, the natural, uh, if there's such a thing, that uh, natural ambient light picture of Foxy. We've boosted up the actual exposure there to so, so we can see him. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, right, I'm going to get my camera. I'm going to say, I want the depth of field on this to be you know, kind of middle of the row, really. I don't want everything in the distance to be nice and sharp. I'd like there a little bit of blur as it goes past him. So let's just say I choose 5.6 as an aperture. All right, so in my camera, I choose 5.6. I then take, because I'm outside, it's maybe a bright day. It wasn't on those, but maybe it's a bright day. I'm going to bring my ISO down as well, because I'm outdoors. You know, I'm going to take the ISO down to maybe 50 or 100, something like that. Then I'm going to get my shutter speed, and I'm just going to start to dial it up until I get the kind of look I want in the clouds. And I've got a little video here to show you what I mean by that. So here, this is just when I pointed the camera out of my office window. You can see it's nice and bright there because it's exposing for the window frame and maybe the trees. But you can see now, look, as I dial up that shutter speed, look what's happening to the clouds. There's getting more and more detail. It looked like there was no detail there at all, first of all. But the more I increase that shutter speed, the more detail I get in the actual, um, in, the, in the clouds. The uh, Once we've done that, so here we go. We're now going to take the picture of Foxy then. So we're in front of Foxy. We've put 5.6. We've got ISO down to 50 or maybe 100. And then before I turn the flash on, I'm just looking at Foxy through the camera and I'm just kind of dialing that shutter speed up till now I start to see detail in the clouds. And when it gets to the point, I think, yeah, I like those clouds. That's looking pretty good. That's when I then bring the flash in. So I get the scene using the shutter speed or basically the camera settings is setting me the scene. I'm thinking that's looking great. Then I bring the flash in. Now, one thing to be wary of here is the fact that if you're, you are having those settings in your camera of 5.6 and ISO 100 and you increase the shutter speed, if you go beyond the native sync speed, the speed that we talked about last week where your flash and your camera can talk really well together so that all the flashlight goes onto the sensor before it kind of closes. If you don't, if you go beyond that speed, you are going to have to turn on high speed sync. But if you don't go beyond it, like for my camera, 250th of a second, if I get fairly decent detail in the clouds by dialing up to 250th, happy days. I'll just use the flash in its normal mode so that you can just do one big bang of light and light up Foxy. But let's talk about the actual flash. So I'm now, I can choose to put my flash in either manual or TTL. And to be honest with you, some, I change it sometimes. Sometimes if it's a very bright day, I will go into manual because I feel I can get more out of it by pushing it up. Whereas with TTL, I can only go plus three stops. In manual, I can keep on going and going and going. So I do find I get more out of it by, um, by dialing up in manual. But it's not, it's not an essential thing. So we put the uh, we put the camera uh, to do the settings of Foxy. Sorry, of the scene. We bring the flash in. It could be on TTL. It could be on manual. And then we take a shot. Now, if you're kind of using TTL and there's just not that much light on Foxy, then you can just do increase the power of the if the flash compensation. If you're in manual, just dial up the flash until you get enough light on Foxy. So at the same time, now when you're taking that picture, you press that shutter button. The ambient light is the sky, beautiful sky. The flashlight lands onto Foxy. You've got a great picture of, of the combination of the two, the background and the foreground. And this is the kind of thing here to show you. Let's have a quick look here. I've got the before and after. So you can see on the far left, you've got the picture without flash. The kind of thing that you would do if you were just kind of out and about with friends, loved ones or whatever, and you just want to take their picture. Or maybe you're just not somebody who uses flash. You would kind of increase the exposure so that they're nicely exposed but the background is naturally going to blow out. But if you wanted to have detail in the clouds, you will have to use a flash. So then what you do is you use the camera settings to get the actual background how you want it, then bring the flash in 
and that's the third picture to light it how you want the subject now that third picture there where you can see where it says it's got foxy it says plus flash that's had a little bit of finishing retouches uh, to it but you get the idea you get the idea of that right let's have a quick uh, come out of here because we are going to recap this let me just take a break let's have a quick look in old uh, in the comments because i'll make sure everyone gets this so ian burton's put so i'm not wrong light and trigger don't do ttl so i'll have to meter for 5.6 um light and trigger don't do ttl your your your, your flash does the ttl you turn it on using your remote uh, ian so what's basically going to happen is by using TTL, these fairies that are inside there work really, they're really good at maths and they're going to say, right, they take a shot and as you're taking that shot, it goes, right, you want this much light on your pitch, on your subject. But that's allowing the camera, so the flash to take control. You might say, actually, no, I want a little bit more. So then you can use flash compensation to increase it a little bit. So even though the camera says, I'm going to give you this much, you can override it and say, no, 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 I want this much. All right. So don't worry about having to meter for five or six. If you're using TTL, it already will do. It will meter for that. But you might want to add a bit more flash in using that flash compensation. All right. With manual, it's pretty much chimping. You know what I mean? It really is. You'll put it on the flash on a certain setting, take a picture, look at it on your screen if you're tethering, which I advise you do. You think, no, I need a bit more light on there. And then just increase it. Then just increase the flash power. Let's have a quick look in here. What's the white balance set to? Derek said that. Uh, Derek, I tend to use auto. I'll be honest with you, I do use auto. That's pretty good these days. It never used to be. Uh, and when I remember to do so, I will have a grey card and I'll get the person to hold a grey card. Uh, James Dietrich has put flash on or off camera. Uh, the, I generally, uh, James, I will always have the flash off the camera. And my preferred modifier is an octa. I like to use the octas. But it all depends what environment you're in. Uh, and what kind of look you want. You know what I mean? You might you want to have, have a really kind of hard look uh, on somebody where you might just use a really big reflector to just push some hard light on them. Actually, that's a really good point. Before we do a recap, that's a really good point, James. I'm glad you've said that because I am going to do some considerations. Let me just dive into the considerations. It's, that's well led into. So this really, this leads on from what James has just asked there, I guess, in a way, where it says match the natural light, all right? What I mean by that is, if you're outside and it's a really cloudy day and there's no shadows on the ground, like it was when I was taking the picture of Foxy, I would then use a modifier that's going to give me a nice big soft light, like the Octa, with the diffusion panels in it. Because I want to match what the scene looks like. Because if I'm photographing Foxy on a very, very you know cloudy day where there's no shadows, but I put a hard light on him, he's just not going to match the scene. It's not going to match right. So before you take your pictures, have a look around. What, what are the shadows like on the ground? Are they hard or are they soft? And that's going to really dictate to you what modifier choice you go for. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, Cliff Harvey says, will any of this work when the flash is on the camera? Absolutely it will. It's just a, it's just a matter of what you want that light to look like. You know? But it's the same principle, uh, Cliff. You know what I mean? Whether you have it on the camera or you have it coming off the camera to create some kind of lights and shadows as opposed to filling the face uh, with light, all right? Uh, right, I'm gonna dive back in and then obviously we will come to the uh, Q&A section, but let me just quickly dive back to the start on that one bit. So just to recap, ordinarily without flash, you're gonna take a picture, your camera can only expose for the subject or the sky, it can't expose for both. So if you're photographing somebody outside, if you haven't got a flash, you'll have to increase your exposure so that they have a nice amount of light on them, but by doing that, you're gonna blow out the sky. That's just the way it is, that's just the way it is. So if you bring in a flash, what you'll then do is use your camera, you'll increase the shutter speed to then bring down the detail in the clouds. So let's just play that little video. So we bring down, now we've got our settings in our camera. We slowly start to dial up the shutter speed until we start to see detail coming in the clouds. And when it looks like how we want it to be, stop there. You know what your shutter speed is. Then you bring in the flash and start taking the pictures. Now, um, it's as simple as that. I don't know what else. It really, really is that simple. All right, so uh, there you can see that's the actual thing when I've increased the shutter speed. Now I need to bring the flash in. So I then uh, manual, either put the, put the flash into manual or TTL. Um, I tend to prefer manual most of the time, to be honest with you. Then you're gonna take the shot. 
and then because you've exposed you've used the camera to expose for the scene you've then brought the flash in you're then going to get a nice sky and a lit subject all right hope that makes sense now i'll go over those uh, considerations let's have a quick look here so i talked about matching the light that is a really really important one making sure that you do match the actual um the the look of the uh, light on your subject with what the light is in the environment uh, next consideration is uh, somebody uh, asked me this when i was doing it um a while back in this presentation for castle camera somebody said well why do you need to use a flash why not just use a bounce board or a reflector well i i kind of see why they're saying that but the thing is if you're increasing your shutter speed first of all to dial down so that you've got detail in the sky you're decreasing the amount of light that's coming in and then you're going to try and bounce something you're not going to bounce anything back so you need to have a flash to, to sort out the subject basically a bounce board would be a great solution uh, but unfortunately we have to pay out and we do have to get a flash for doing this uh, one more consideration the power of your flash obviously that's really really important because you've actually got a choice here if you were using uh, if you're going to be using a flash if you're out outside on a really really bright day and you just dial up your shutter speed and you go beyond your sync speed the nat you know the native sync speed then you're going to be in the realms of high speed sync uh, and that's when really if you're on a really really bright day that's when you know you need maybe a more powerful light to be able to do that pulsing that the high speed sync does to be able to fill that sensor sufficiently all right so you, sometimes when we try to do this with um just normal speed lights the four double a battery speed lights you might find that you struggle just a little bit so it's worth either kind of waiting a bit later on in the day which is what i used to do right let me just have a quick look at some uh, questions uh boom, boom. so there's james blow what's the question from james let's just quickly scoot up i might have to check on these afterwards let's have a quick look oh james every you ever use a second flash in these types of shots james uh yes yeah i do although like brian says there it's not really my kind of thing to bring in more more lights i do like to use one because i like the the lighting to look natural for the environment as opposed to having extra lights coming in from all over the place uh but there is a shot in my portfolio where there was a guy on a on a he's got an aston martin and he stood in the front of the aston martin with his dog and i did use two lights for that so it's exactly the same process right okay let me just give you a quick break uh youtube want, wants this wants this private video i don't know what you mean there luke Owen. <laughs> let me now just uh show you something just very very quickly give you a break from my voice i want to just sh give you like a, a few minutes just a little interview chat i had with dave cross really really good friend of mine who's the guy that is responsible for putting together the photoshop summit so i asked him just a few questions about it i'm gonna give you a break from my voice I'm going to get some water. Just have a listen to what Dave says about the Photoshop Summit. All right, so Dave then, tell us, what is the Photoshop Virtual Summit? Well, if you imagine any kind of in the past when we used to go to a convention or a conference where you would see a whole group of instructors teaching classes at different times in different rooms, it's kind of that, but all virtual. So it's a, a collection of 20 top Photoshop instructors, each teaching a couple of classes spread out over a five day period. So there's a total of 40 classes and at least, well, probably over 30 hours of Photoshop instruction and it's free to watch. Well, I gotta say it was both easy and really difficult because it was easy to put down my wish list of who are the top instructors that I would love to be on this team because in part I've watched them and I've learned from them over the years, but also I, I know them as just good people. And I mm -hmm. thought that was equally important because I've always felt that if someone is just a, a good giving person, then that's going to naturally make them a good instructor. So the mm. easy part was putting down a list. The hard part was I think I got to about 28 pretty quickly. <laughs> so then it was like, oh no, now I have to <laughs> see, you know, and and honestly, except for I think maybe one or two people that just were totally slammed with other projects, every mm. single person that I ended up asking said, Oh yeah, I'm in. How how do I start? And as you mm -hmm. remember, that first one all happened 
pretty darn fast. So if they just go to the main website, and I'm sure you'll have a, a link for them, uh, there's a, a button that you click to sign up for the free pass. And the way that it works, and this is just the way that our system is set up so we can keep track of everybody and make sure that everyone's being informed, each day, the morning of the summit, you'll get an email, which is a link to that day's classes. And each hour on the hour, Eastern Standard Time, although I'll talk more about that in a second, a new class is released, and those that day's worth of classes is available to watch for free for 48 hours. At that time, once that 48-hour period is done, then the day's classes are moved into kind of an archived member area, and that's where the VIP pass comes in. Now, as far as the time zone, one thing to address is the classes are not broadcast live. They're just released at a certain time. And I say that because I have, get a lot of response from people saying, well, that's going to be the middle of the night in where I live. I don't want to miss it. There's really nothing to be gained by watching at the time it's released because it's not live. You won't miss anything by tuning in later. So that's why they're available for 48 hours. And then, and that's all included in the free ticket. And then the VIP pass is an optional uh, choice we've given people who want either are worried that they'll miss some classes or they just want the option to rewatch the classes. And that VIP pass gives you lifetime access to watch all the classes, plus some additional things like any uh, session notes that are provided by the instructors, uh, downloadable practice files and things like that. All right, so that's the uh, the Photoshop Summit. You'll find a link for that in the description part of the video. Uh, I, if I had a hat on, I'd take it off to Dave because the amount of work he's done putting that together is just insane, absolutely insane. Um, right, I'm gonna. We have got an official Q and A section coming up, but I know there are some that have been asked already. I'm just gonna quickly dive into those because I think we might as well. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Nori Cutler. Light intensity falls off as the inverse square of the distance from flash into subject. Yep, you surely need a very strong flash to light up the detail on your main subject. Okay, so what Nori's talking about there is the um, inverse square law. We can always do a webinar on this, but I didn't want to kind of throw this in to basically confuse you. But obviously, if you're outside and you're requiring more power from your flash, in its basic terms, you, if you need more power out of it, you're going to need to bring it in close. Now, when you're using high-speed sync, the issue with high-speed sync is because your flash isn't going bang and giving off one pop, but instead it's going pop, 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 pop like this as the actual shutter is opening. But the first curtain is then pop, 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 and then eventually the second curtain comes up and closes. By popping, rather than giving, giving one big bang to fill the flash, uh, to fill the sensor. What that means is it's having to recycle again and again and again really, really quickly. So it can't get back to its full power. So because of that, when you're using high speed sync, you will need to bring your flash in closer. High speed sync isn't the best if you wanted to have a full length shot because you're going to have to come in so close sometimes that you're not going to get much light falling on the floor. All right, so that's one thing just kind of mentioned there. There was a question I saw uh, a bit lower down from, I think it was Tony Davey, was it? Let's have a look here. Tony Davey. Uh, hi, Glenn. If you shoot at 100 ISO with the same aperture, 5.6, I presume you mean in the same settings that I was using there, Tony, do you still adjust the shutter speed to suit? Absolutely, because when you first dial it in at 100 ISO and f5.6, let's just say that your, your shutter speed, at, when you turn your camera on, is a 60th of a second. If when you look at it, maybe on um, the uh, electronic viewfinder, because you kind of see what you see is what you get as you make adjustments, you see it in real time. I'm not quite so sure how live view works with that. Uh, maybe somebody can dive in. I don't know how live view really does work. Is it like having an EVF? Does it give you a real representation? I don't know. I, I think before when I didn't have an EVF, I used to just take a shot and then look at it. I kind of knew that was better then. But if your shutter speed at a 60th, even though you've got 100 ISO, 5.6, you've got no detail in the clouds, just increase your shutter speed until you see detail in the clouds. I hope that kind of answers what you're asking there, Tony. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Let's have a look here. Uh, Sutty 999 APR, you have settings on flash and on camera. Which has the preference if they are not set the same? Uh, not 100% sure what you mean, <laughs> but if I just explain what I do, I'm in manual on the camera, always manual on the camera, and I tend to go always manual on the flash. However, 
there are times when I'm manual on the camera, I can still use my flash in TTL because my trigger is in TTL, flashed in TTL, I can then dial that in as well. Sometimes I'll do that, it just depends. If it's a really, really bright day, and I know I'm gonna really need to dial up that flash, I'll put it into manual straight away anyway. Uh, right, so Anthony, Anthony Crother says, live view gives a good indication. There you go, yeah. I'm kind of, I've, I haven't used live view that much at all. Uh, I kind of moved over to the old EVF, which I do love. Feels like cheating, but I do love it. Um, Right, I'm gonna kind of, I've got a Photoshop technique for you now. If you folks are ready for this, this is all again to do with the uh, the paddy, the coffee man picture using content aware move. So you might know about this, but then but then you might not. Now this is one of those sort of uh, techniques that you don't want to do all the time because ideally you want to get as bestly composed as we can in camera. But sometimes there are things that you can't do. You can't move them at the time. This is where this technique comes in really handy. So let me just play this for you now. All right, so here's the final retouch picture that you've seen already of the coffee man Paddy, the, the fellow that I photographed just a, a few days ago now. And what I wanna show you is how I've changed part of the composition for the final image. So you can see the final picture here, we've got Paddy leaning against his van, and then the word beans was actually spray painted into the road surface. But if I dive over to a partly retouch picture, this is pretty much just had some changes done to Lightroom and I've extended the sky just for now. But you can see here that the actual real place for where the word beans was, wasn't quite in the center of the actual vehicle wheels. Now, ideally, it would have been great if I could have moved the vehicle forward, but Paddy was there working. You can see just here that the back of the van was open, his coffee sh machine was all working, the heater was plugged in. It just wasn't possible. So sometimes we have to have just a little bit of poetic license to change the composition. So we're gonna move the word beans and the way we're gonna do that is by using a tool over in the toolbar in Photoshop that's been here for a while called Content Aware Move. So I'm gonna select that. Now, when we select a tool in Photoshop, each tool has its own unique options, which you'll see at the top of the screen in the options bar. So you can see here, we've got a mode, which is for move or extend. We've got structure, color, sample all layers, and transform on drop. So let's just kind of explain what this is. So first of all, when I'm using the Content Aware Move tool, it's what you'd call a freehand tool. So to use it, you would kind of draw freehand around a certain area within a picture. Once you've got the marching ant selection, you then click inside of it, drag it, and then reposition it. And depending on what option you've got ticked at the top here, or selected rather, where it says mode to either move or extend, depends on what's happens at the bottom. Now, if I just go back a second, so let's just show you. If I maybe use the word move and I make a freehand selection of the letter A, and then I drag that just down to here, you'll see what happens to process it a little bit, and it does a job of trying to move it. But basically what that does is it'll take the object that you've selected, reposition it, and attempt to cover over the area where it originally was. However, if I changed it to extend, what that basically means is wherever I now click and drag to reposition this letter A, it won't replace the other one, it'll merely add another one in there. Now, what it'll also do by using the options at the top, you can see here it says structure, we use that where wherever we're moving an item to, structure is used to try to match the texture or the structure of the area of what you're moving onto. So here it'd be quite smooth. If I moved it onto a rough area, it would try to match the roughness. And we can control how much you want to match by increasing the structure. Also the same kind of thing with color. Whatever we move and where we move it to, it'll try to match the color of the area around it. Now you would think here, because obviously we've got sliders that can go to their maximum of seven for the structure, and we can go to a maximum, I believe, of 10 for the color. You would think, well, why not just boost it up to the maximum? Well, my experience of using this is when we push these to the maximum, Photoshop then tries to pull in areas around the image and it kind of creates a bit of a smudgy kind of look. So I tend to find that pretty much halfway on both of these tends to work quite well. All right, so, Let's just take that back. We don't need that one doing there. But I'm gonna to try to move now this beans uh, wording further across to the left. 
Now to do this freehand would be quite challenging because obviously the letters are very close to the line there and that could be really difficult to do that all the way across. So what we can actually do is use another selection tool. So I'm going to come to the toolbar and choose the rectangular marquee tool and I'm going to drag out a selection, a rectangular selection which includes the word beans. You can see now that's going straight across left to right. We need to rotate the angle of it so I can go to select menu transform selection, bring my cursor outside of it and now I can rotate the selected area. So let me just zoom in just a little bit to see if I can kind of match the angle. Something like that looks like I can use my down arrow key now to move this selection down just to get it just between the line and the letters. Let's go for a roundabout. That's looking good on the top. Let's move across to the side. Oh, I do need to rotate it just a little bit more. So we'll go to there let's say bring it down a little bit further. Let's have a look. Yeah, I think that's looking good. And we can actually afford now to drag up from the bottom. We don't need to be quite so low down. All right, so once we've done that, we'll go to the options bar, click on the tick. And now what we're going to do is just make sure in the options at the top here, I don't want to duplicate these words. I want to completely move them. I'm going to leave the structure and color midway. That seems to give me the best results. And what I'd like to do is I don't want to do it on the original image just in case it goes wrong. So I'm going to add a new blank layer so that anything I now do is going to go on this layer and not potentially get locked into the layer below and then I've ruined it. So we'll do it onto a blank layer. When I do that, you can see here it says sample all layers. So that means now, even though this layer is transparent, the content aware move tool is going to look through that to the layer below to see what it is that I'm wanting to move. So now that we've done that, let's just zoom out a little bit and I'll click in the middle of the words and I'll drag it across just so that they're kind of positioned a little bit more over to the left hand side. So we'll try somewhere like that and then let go. And that's not bad. That's not bad at all. So let's go to select and deselect. So now we can see we've actually moved the word beans across. I could have moved it a little bit more maybe, but you can see what we've got. Now you can see just a little bit here where that's maybe smoothed out, just a touch. You could just add another blank layer there, get the clone stamp tool. Because you're using a blank layer, just make sure in the top it says current and below or all layers. If you try to use current layer, it's not going to be able to sample from anything because you're not telling it to look through the layers to find some content down below. So we'll use current and below and we could just come in then and just sample some of this texture and just kind of add it in just a little bit just to help it to kind of blend in so that it looks a little bit more realistic, something like that. Let's just take that little bit off just there. So there you go. That's just a quick way that we can use tools that we've got in Photoshop which have been introduced but sometimes because they've been there for a while we tend to forget, especially as Photoshop is updated so often these days, but we forget that these great tools are there. They're not to be used all the time, but sometimes they can really help us out just with a little bit of controlled poetic license. So there you go, Content Aware Move. It's been around for a while, uh, but I've never had any reason to want to use it until then. That's the great thing about all this stuff. I mean, obviously yesterday, you'll be aware that there was a load of updates put into Photoshop and other, uh, other of the apps across the Adobe kind of suite. Uh, some of it, very interesting. Uh, some of it incredibly useful, really, really useful. But it looks updated so often, we'll kind of forget about them. But it's nice to know they're there for later, just in case we need them. Um, cool. All right. So let's have a look then. I've saw some questions coming in regarding the actual photography side of it. I don't want to keep you too long, but let's just dive over and have a quick look through. There were some great comments from people uh, to do with live view. So I'm going to just really show you some of those here. Uh, I think this uh, WEA tutor, he's put to get your live view to simulate the exposure. There's normally a setting for this in the camera's menu. Anyway, there is in my Canon. All right. Okay. It's cool. Worth to know for those folks who are out there who are Canon shooters. Uh, there's a good one here from Jeff Bayliss. Uh, I didn't actually have to do this, Jeff, unless it was on by default. I don't know, mate. But uh, with electronic viewfinders, people need to ensure that they have apply settings to apply settings to live view. Okay, cool. Um, jum, jum, jum. Another one here. This is interesting one. Don't think you can trigger a flash if you've still got live view on a DSLR. Interesting. All right. And there was one more. I wanted to quickly see this. Uh, no, don't think so. Don't think there was. Right. 
Oh yeah, that one there, that was it. Dave Cross is an awesome teacher. <laughs> he certainly is. He really, really is. All right, so um, there you go. I, I'm hoping that makes sense. It, it is a simple process. If you're anything like me, when you've kind of got your camera and your flash, I used to really overthink things. I used to overcomplicate things. Uh, and I kind of just stripped it back and thought, right, let, how can I make this really, really simple? And that's why I do what I do. I tend to find manual is a much more... Um, it's, I just find it much easier to use because I know what I'm going to get, all right? I know I'm going to get a consistent shot time after time after time where I am. Uh, I can then set the scene using my camera, the shutter speed. I bring in my flash. I take the picture and the two go together. You know, it's, I, dare I say, it's not rocket science, but it can almost seem like it if we overthink it. Just overthink it. Just keep it simple. Get out there. Get yourself a mannequin head that you can't see that's on top of my shelf there and just practice with it. I wanted to just mention a couple of things as well, just about the, the one that we did last week, the invisible black background. I had some great emails that came through from people who were having successes with it, but a couple from people who weren't. And one in particular, uh, one of the things that they got saying, I can't get it to work. Well, there was two things, first of all. One person was saying that they can't seem to get their shutter speed on their camera to go faster than 250th of a second. Now, I can guarantee the reason for that is is because you haven't got high speed sync turned on on the trigger so that the flash is going to be in high speed sync. The minute you turn it on, it'll then go. Because what you'll find is worth trying if you've got high speed sync and this is all working for you. When you've got high speed, high speed sync turned on and your shutter speed is going crazy, like 8,000th of a second, press it to turn it off and look what happens. Your camera will automatically revert to the native sync speed. It just does it. So you have to have it on. The other one was that I had some people who were trying to, they were, they were getting a really, really black background before they brought their flash in. But then they brought the flash in and they were saying, oh, they're getting light bouncing all over the place and I can't seem to make it black. It's not, it doesn't matter how much you increase your shutter speed. If that flash is in nice and close and there's a really reflective wall right behind it, it's going to hit it. It's going to light it all up. All right, so that's when we have to think about, right, I need to control this light to prevent it from spilling around. All right, so the technique does work, but sometimes, especially when we're indoors and there's the chance of the light hitting walls, it goes off. We need to control it. Snoots, egg crate grids, whatever. Whatever. All right, so that's that. Uh, let's have a quick one here from Ian Burton. My mate Ian. On Nikon, you need to set flash sync speed to 1320, which gives high speed sync. There you go. Brilliant. This is what's really good about this. Obviously, we're all, you know, we all have our own preferences with what kit we use. You know, Ian there is a Nikon uh, user, there's Canon users, there's Olympus users, there's, you know, all kinds. I'm Sony. There's all sorts of people in the room. Ian. What's great about having these chat rooms is that, you know, you folks know more about those cameras than I do. You can dive in and we can all help each other out, which is. Sounds really corny, but this is what this is all about, isn't it? Community all kind of diving in and helping each other. So, uh, yeah, good stuff. All right. Uh, one last question here I got from James Dietrich. I noticed that Westcott has a 20 cent inch doctor and a 24. Would one be better than the other? <laughs> I'm going to give you a politician's answer now, James. It all depends. It all depends what it is that you're going to want to that you're going to want to do with it. Uh, so it's one's 26 inch octa box and 24 inch beauty dish they're going to give a different kind of light. That difference in light can be very, very subtle. So I would suggest just stick with the Okta, play around with it a little bit. When you've got the Okta, rather than investing in a beauty dish, I would then just get, you can get, I forget what they call them now, but a deflector. You can actually get, so let's just say there's your Okta box and in the middle of it is your flash tube. You can actually get deflectors to put over the front of the flash tube. Take out the actual diffusion panel. So then really what you've got, in essence, is a huge uh, beauty dish. Because it's doing the same thing. The flash goes off, it hits that deflector, it comes back into the, the actual softbox and goes round and out. That's exactly what happens with a beauty dish. So if you're kind of undecided, do I want a beauty dish or not, spend less money by getting a deflector first to see if you're going to use it. And then if you like it, go and get yourself a beauty dish. Um, right, okay, cool. Uh, one from Norrie. Using your camera in AV priority and with your flash forces, shutter speed between 1, 6 and 10. So high speed flash is not possible unless you work in manual mode on the camera. There you go, cool. Thank you very much, Norrie. Norrie, you are the font of all knowledge. It's good having people like you in because I'm basic. You clearly know your stuff when it comes to all the technicals and we need people like you, we really do. Cool, right, I'm going uh, to dive off. 
I'm going to play you a little video which shows you the behind the scenes of when we photographed Foxy, Simon, so you can see where the lights were in comparison to where he was. Uh, and then that's it. So quick question for you. Let me know in the comments. Fridays, any good for these? Or would you prefer weekends or any other day in the week? Let me know in the comments. But uh, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope it's useful. Let me know by emailing me, glynn at glynnjewish.com. Check out the Photoshop Summit. You can get the free pass for 48 hours uh, to check out all the classes. Uh, but there you go. That's all from me. I'm going to play the little video and I'll see you next time. Have a great weekend, everyone. <laughs>